Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are our ACM members. I'm Will Trace, Lockheed Martin Fellow Emeritus and Chair of ACM SIGSOFT, the Special Interest Group on Software Engineering. I'm also a member of the ACM Professional Development Committee who is bringing you this webinar today, and I've served as the editor of ACM Software Engineering Notes. You'll find my full profile in the bio widget on the left side of your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. You can see some of the highlights of ACM's focus on the screen and what resources that they have to offer. Moving on, before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown to you on the slide in front right now. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom of the panel, you'll find a number of widgets and resources. If you're experiencing any problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command R if you're in Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Finally, if that doesn't work, close or relaunch the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And click on the Submit button. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it is available. And of course, check learningacm.org in a few days for any updates. You can also use Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag pound sign ACM webinar transfer. Today's presentation is Are You Getting Traction? Tales from the Tech Transfer Trenches by Satish Chandra. Satish is a principal engineer at Samsung Electronics, actually senior principal engineer. Previously, he was a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs, where his research focused on program analysis, domain-specific languages, and data communication protocols. Later in his career, he was a staff member at IBM Research, where his research focused on bug finding and verification, software synthesis, and test automation. He joined Samsung Electronics in 2013, where he currently leads the Advanced Programming Tools Research Team. He's also a ACM Distinguished Scientist and a member of ACM SIGSOFT. Satish, we look forward to your presentation here today. OK, thank you, Will. Uh, so I will be speaking about my experiences with tech transfer in an industry lab, industry research lab position. So before I get started with the content, I would like to say that these are my personal views. I'm not speaking on behalf of IBM and neither on behalf of Samsung. Also, the material that I'm going to uh, present today is taken from published sources and from my own recollection. I might have uh, misremembered some details, but I cannot cross-verify those by going back to email from those times. So let's get started. When, when we take up a job in an industry uh, research lab, we have two roles. One is to do research very much like uh, academics do. So we uh, write papers, present them in conferences, hire summer interns, uh, collaborate with faculty members, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is also a second part of the job. The expectation from your employer is that the work that you are doing, if successful, can lead to some business impact. That part is often quite tricky, and that's going to be the topic of my presentation today. Uh, 
along the charts, you will see I have embedded some links. You can uh, browse through those links offline. Some are articles published by me and my co-authors. The one on this page is not mine, but it is definitely very relevant to the material being presented today as well. So with that, my background, so I, uh, before I came to Samsung, I spent about 11 years at IBM Research, uh, both at uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York and also in IBM India Research Lab, and they have two locations, uh, New Delhi and Bangalore, and I have been to both those. I have worked at both those locations. During my time at IBM Research, I had an opportunity to engage in multiple tech transfer efforts. Some went uh, really well, some not so well, and I'll uh, give examples of uh, one of each kind. But in terms of topic areas, the efforts were in uh, test automation in services, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, I have done products that involve static analysis technology. I have uh, tried internal deployment of bug finding tools, and then some other initiatives as well. Some of these initiatives were quite successful, and when successful, the impact was recognized by the company. I would also like to say that this work is done in collaboration with a large uh, cast of people, both from IBM India Labs and IBM TJ Watson Labs, and with a lot of support from the respective management chains. So in the time available today, I would like to present two topics. One is deployment of test automation in services, and I will explain momentarily what services means. And then in the later part of the presentation, I am going to talk about internal deployment of bug finding tools. So not everyone may be familiar with what are services, so I would like to take a couple of minutes to explain that. Here on this page, you see logos of a number of uh, businesses or companies that you will associate with uh, software companies, roughly speaking. Some do more than that, but roughly software companies. Now, on the left-hand side, these are companies that we often associate with product businesses. So what are their attributes? They employ lots of software engineers. They serve a market size of several hundred billion dollars. The revenue that they earn is generally from prepackaged software sales. In other words, they are selling licenses to their software. And the way they compete in the marketplace is by differentiating their products from their competitor, competitors' products in terms of features. If we look at some of the companies that are now on the right side of the page, and some, as you would notice, were on both left and uh, they were kind of in the middle, so they do both. But the companies mentioned here are primarily service businesses. They also employ lots of software engineers. They also serve a comparable market size in terms of uh, billion, 100 billions of US dollars. Their revenues, however, come from selling software engineering as a service to other businesses. So, for example, if you are a bank, you may want to get IT services from one of uh, these companies. They differentiate their offerings based on expertise and the cost and quality of the service provided. And this is the point at which software engineering research is extremely relevant because it directly ties into the bottom line. So I had an opportunity to work directly with IBM services businesses, business. So here I was in Bangalore in 2010 with a clean slate, and I was looking for interesting software engineering problems that are relevant to software services. Now, Bangalore, as we know, has a large IT presence, there are large uh, services companies are located there, uh, including uh, IBM. And IBM has a large testing practice uh, located in Bangalore as well. 
uh, we talked to many practitioners and managers and we narrowed down on test automation as a research topic. And the reason behind that is that it, it seemed like if we were successful, it could impact a fairly significant fraction of the testing services business that is being delivered out of Bangalore. So it made sense to look at the test automation problem. However, I would like to mention that that's not the only problem that uh, can be researched upon. There are many other research topics available, some of which uh, are written up in this article, the link for which you see at the bottom of the page. So let's, uh, let's talk about test automation. What's the problem? So websites, as you know, have to be tested. They need to work. And it turns out that uh, websites have to be tested over and over again because there are lots of variations that can happen. So the application could change either on the user interface side or on the back end. Uh, browser versions change. So for example, uh, some company upgrades their browsers and some compatibility with uh, HTML or JavaScript or whatever changes. Um, businesses would like their user interfaces to work across browsers seamlessly. So it's no longer uh, okay to say that our product only works on this vendor's browser. They, they would prefer it to work on everyone's browser, right? In addition, uh, these days, it's not acceptable to only support the desktop browser platform. Lots of people use tablets and even smartphones and so forth to access these uh, services and therefore testing needs to be done across these platforms as well. Now if let's say you are a bank and you are trying to have your uh, customer portal tested, testing exhaustively is not really your core competence. That's not how you differentiate yourself in the marketplace. So that's the kind of work that uh, companies prefer to outsource to one of these third-party service providers, and then they carry out all the testing work that is involved. So that's the setting. That's where test automation comes in, and that's where services about test automation come in. Let's look at test automation in a little bit more detail. So the life cycle of a test case often starts with a manual test case. Manual test case really means that someone, uh, a designer maybe wrote down in sometimes just plain prose what a test case is supposed to do. So, And I'll show you an example in just a minute. Sometimes it's uh, written down in Excel sheets, sometimes in just plain documents and so forth. The job of test automation is to take those natural language or unstructured uh, specification of what's supposed to happen and create programs uh, that then drive a web browser through a particular scenario. And these programs could be in a variety of languages as mentioned on the slide. Now, here in the yellow box on the left is an example a manual test case. So if you see, this is essentially instructions for a human being to carry out uh, some tasks on a browser. So for example, let me, let me read out uh, the step number two, enter the intended book search name as within quotes MySQL at the within quotes title field and select category as all in a drop down list. So these are obviously instructions that someone who is on that online bookstore page can follow along and make sure that whatever happens on the website is what you would expect or what the test case says should happen, right? That's a manual test case. Now on the box in the right-hand side, you see what's the result of test automation. And here we are looking at a fragment of Java program. This Java program, and this is just a very small fragment of it, is supposed to uh, drives the browser automatically, but essentially carrying out exactly the set of ma manual steps mentioned on the left-hand side box. So converting from 
the natural language representation on the left hand side to the program shown on the right, right hand side is what test automation is all about. Now, is this a significant problem? So, real applications, especially those coming from, say, financial sector, your banks, your insurance companies, and so forth, have thousands of manual tests, sometimes even uh, tens of thousands of them. And if you were to manually execute all of them, then just the regression cycle would run into several months. And typically, companies don't have that much time between releases to run through the entire uh, test suite manually. So the only effective way to carry out good regression testing is to invest in test automation. You want automated test execution. However, here is a catch. Test automation comes with costs. First is the initial cost. Automation is time consuming and also requires a specialized skills. You will note that executing a manual test case just uh, by human means is uh, not uh, a highly skilled job, but creating a program that would do the same thing requires higher levels of skill. Second is the maintenance cost. I mentioned before that things could change. So let's say a small changes happen in the user interface. Many times automated test scripts, scripts would break, and if you had to go and fix up all those test scripts over and over again, then that kind of negates the benefits you get out of uh, test automation. So these are some of the concerns in the mind of minds of practitioners, and they struggle with these kinds of issues uh, all the time. Okay, so we we did uh, we looked at this problem and did some research and. So here on this page, I am. Uh, so we, we built a tool called Automating Test Automation. So here on the page, you are seeing the, st uh, the situation as before, where a person is doing test automation. Uh, we uh, built some technology that is a semi-automatic approach to converting these manual test cases to test scripts. And let me tell you just a little bit uh, about it. So. Uh, but the purpose, as you can see, is to convert the manual test steps into test scripts. And so that technology was called ATA, uh, or for automating test automation. It's a semi-automatic conversion of English sentences to scripts. Uh, it's not based on deep AI or anything like that. In fact, it uses very lightweight natural language processing, and it uses lightweight program synthesis approach to explore some possibilities. Um, and it uh, it's not, as I mentioned, it's semi-automatic, so it, it cannot work on completely unattended mode, uh, but, but it works with some human help. Um, one of the things that we did in ATA to, is to address the script fragility problem. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if UI changes, then your existing script may not be able to deal with it. Uh, but we came up with a robust, mostly DOM-independent script representation, which proved to be resilient to these UI changes. DOM is a data structure used inside web browsers. So the advantage of the tool uh, of the ATA technology is that it lowers the cost of entry to test automation because humans don't have to sit down and write those complex programs, and it also reduces the need for test maintenance because more often than not, the scripts that are captured using this tool uh, do not uh, are resilient are resilient to these uh, UI changes. And we wrote this article called test "Automating Test Automation" in the International uh, Conference on Software Engineering, which is uh, one of the flagship six soft conferences that uh, are held every every year. So we are quite happy, and we claimed that well, we had a winner, and then our uh, Manager came along, and it says that, well, uh, you know, make an impact. May, your, your research is good, make an impact. Uh, so we thought that, well, sure, this is obviously game-changing technology, no problem, we'll do, and, and off we go, right? So that was actually the start of our problems. So we thought that, well, we are in Bangalore, we know lots and lots of practitioner teams, 
And you know, in, the setup is that typically in these services companies, there are these dedicated account teams that serve different clients. So we thought that, well, we'll just go to various teams and show them uh, our tool and it will be a slam dunk situation. So we will uh, do a demo. Some of those demos will go to pilot and then to adoption. What pilot means is that you sit down with a, a team, you bring your technology, you show that your technology works in their setting, uh, so there is no problem if they were to start using their tool. Uh, but it's not real work in the sense that it's still kind of an R&D mode activity. Adoption would be when they are using your tool and your methodology for real uh, in preference to what they were doing before. So we are coming from research. We thought that, well, we will just barge right in and, and all of this would happen. So we contacted a large number of client accounts. We got we, we gave lots and lots of demos. Many of them led to doing a detailed pilot, but we didn't really see any instance of adoption in the beginning. And this was kind of a surprise to us. So one of the things that we realized as we did this is that when you go to pilots, you have to really uh, deal with real world situations. So this is very different from writing a paper. In the real world test, Manual tests were pretty ugly. There were badly written manual tests. There were missing steps. Uh, we did not anticipate the kind of conditional flows and exceptions that actually happened in the real world. We did not happen, uh, anticipate the level of verification steps that were uh, required. We did not anticipate the kinds of UI change resilience that was required, and so on and so forth. So it turns out that a lot of work is needed to take uh, your prototype from a research level prototype to something that works uh, for a customer. And another complication for us is that in the close-knit community of testing practitioners, we really couldn't afford any negative publicity. So we could not really go and say that, well, ATA cannot handle this. That would have been a deal breaker. So we tried very hard to just, just make it work. And, and, and and this was a lot of work, but a lot of necessary work. Even then, we got a lot of pushback from the de delivery managers. Uh, so we were asking delivery managers for a lot, right? We were asking them to really change the way they do their work. But those managers are really conservative by nature. Uh, so they would give us responses uh, such as, well, the client will not allow this new tool or we already have a framework in place, or well, uh, this is an IBM only technology, what if we need to work with other vendors, and so on and so forth. And they are not wrong. They, they, they are incentivized for predictable, timely delivery. They are not incentivized to uh, take on risky, unproven uh, things. And we re realize that this our pitch that look how easy we make test automation, that pitch wasn't really working. We needed to articulate the value in terms of return on investment analysis. So that is the ROI, return on investment. And this, this to us was a chicken and egg problem because until you get an engagement, where do you get the data to show the return on investment? And without any uh, proof point, no one would be willing to adopt the tool uh, in production beyond just a, just a pilot. So in some more detail, when we talk about software tools, even though software, a research tool is, mentioned, is developed in-house, that does not mean that it is free. It, there may be no licensing fees, fee internally, but there are costs in adopting the tool. So from, a, from the perspective of a delivery manager, here are some of the costs. How long does it take for a tester to be trained in ATA, right? Uh, what are the risks? It's an unproven research tool. If this does not work out, it produces non-standard artifacts. They, they may need to do some work over again. What's the risk involved? What are the financial repercussions? Uh, are we billing for person hours or for number of tests? So there are many costs in the minds uh, of 
a delivery manager. So we had to figure out how to convince people that the benefits outweigh the costs. So we need to find out or document that how much more effective is a tester using ATA relative to the status quo. How many tests are automated uh, per tester per day before and after? How much does ATA reduce the need of test repair? We had to quantify all of these things to convince someone. Now, we, we ran into a bunch of uh, good luck. There was one account, it was an internal account, not a customer account, that was trying to uh, do a huge test automation task. They had about 7,000 test cases that they needed to automate in a relatively short amount of time, and they were kind of desperate, and they were open to uh, working with us and using our tool in production mode, and this allowed us to collect some citable data, even if there were a lot of caveats. I would like to note that we provided excellent customer support. We went out of our way to make sure that this team is very happy, and in retrospect, that ended up being a really good thing. These guys became our testimonial, our advocates, and, and that sort of uh, helped uh, sort of uh, open more doors for us. So just in terms of what kind of uh, data that we were after, uh, we documented, you know, before using the ATA technology, what was the rate at which they were able to automate tests. So here in the table, if you look at the first row only, the left column says that, well, they were automating three to five tests per tester per day, and with ATA technology, they were up to about 10 test cases per tester per day. Uh, the learning curve was short, one to two days to bring someone up to speed. The scripts were automatically repaired in many cases, and so on and so forth. So we did all this measurement. In fact, we wrote a paper about it also available at the link shown below. So the exact data shown here is actually not uh, that important. The presence of data or having the data in your hand was very important to really convince anyone that this is a technology worth using in production use. So as we were just knocking doors and talking to many delivery managers, we really got an epiphany that why don't we approach this from the sales side of the business rather than trying to change how people do the work after a contract has been signed and work has begun let's try to get this idea in right from the beginning. So we got the sales team on board with the idea. Their incentive is to sell the client on service quality, right? And their being from research and using new technologies uh, obviously helps. And it immediately takes away um, the argument that the client does not want it. The client, of course, wants it. So this kind of the sales team becomes your ally and it leads to much better scaling of the sales job. So previously we were talking to delivery managers and now we were instead talking to high-powered CIOs or their delegates and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. So we got much better traction this way because we found, where we, we found who is the real decision maker, how can we get our technology in the process in the best possible way. Let me come back to this last mile discussion. So people talk about uh, last mile, right? So there is a significant overhead in customizing the tool to each client's liking. The thing to note here is that a research tool typically does not solve an end-to-end -end process, right? It's handling only a slice of the problem. So for example, in test automation, Test automation itself is not the be-all and end-all. It's part of the overall testing process. You have to deal with where tests are stored. What do you do after you have done uh, the automation? What's the structure of the repository? What's the structure of the reporting? So all these things about exporting from this tool and interoperating with this other tool, these are all real concerns. They may not be research, but unless you have tool and process compatibility, people will not adopt your technology in production mode. So we did all of that. There was lots of uh, installation, hand-holding, workshops, and uh, whatnot. 
What we also found is that these accounts were much more demanding of in-house tools than they would ever be of off-the-shelf tools, right? So if you are buying off-the-shelf tools, uh, its features are um, on the sales brochure, you take it or leave it. But hey, if it's an in-house developed tool, you can always ask your research team to add more features and, and sure enough, they did that. So they know that they have that leverage. Something to keep in mind. Coming back to this whole metaphor of last mile, uh, I feel that that's kind of a deeply flawed metaphor when it comes to tech transfer. It's really the last N minus one miles. If you look at this timeline, you have an idea, you show, you, you build a prototype, you show that it works on benchmarks, and then uh, you write a paper. But then there are all these additional steps. You have to show that it works on real world code, uh, the code, the, the kinds of situations that did not come in your benchmarks. You have to make sure that the tool is usable by others, right? So user interface and so forth, uh, everything is very important. And then finally, you have to show positive return on investment. So all of these steps, I feel, are necessary for uh, business to really adopt your software tool. And this is what uh, I feel that just this last mile kind of gives a somewhat wrong impression of the work involved here. Most of the work involved is, is after you write the paper. So I'd like to give some retrospective here on, on this problem. Uh, we we identified the right problem to work on, so that was good. Oftentimes, you work on a problem that no one is even interested in hearing about, but that was not the case here. Every time we went to a team, they were interested in uh, hearing out what we had to say. Uh, measuring or measurable positive return on investment was the key to acceptance. Without having the data from that one team that we documented, we would not uh, be uh, have been taken seriously by those uh, new accounts either. Uh, and then what was very gratifying to us was the impact on the practice. The tool does see production use inside the company. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's very pleasing. Um, in terms of things that we uh, found only in hindsight, we clearly vastly underestimated this whole last mile thing. Uh, we were pretty naive about top-down versus bottom-up adoption. In this case, it turned out that top-down was a better path than trying to struggle through uh, bottom-up. And then uh, also we didn't really have a good sense of how much time it will take to truly transfer the technology off our hands. So some lessons in there. More broadly, in, in the sphere of services, here are some observations I'd like to make. Clients clearly want innovations, but they also want predictable delivery of a project. Uh, and this, these are sort of contradictory demands, and it's hard to kind of balance, balance the two. Also, researchers are perceived as magicians, right? They are expected to build tools that have zero learning curve, cause no change to process, and are just magical in their effectiveness. And it's a challenge to sort of come anywhere close to fulfilling these expectations. And finally, differentiating home, differentiating and homegrown technology sounds very good, but does not always match the business, or at least there is a, a sort of significant and long path to be uh, taken in order to uh, make it match the business. So that was kind of a first part uh, where I uh, shared with you the experiences that we had in deploying test automation in services. I would like to use the remaining uh, time that I have today to talk to you about internal deployment of bug finding tools. So the time was, uh, the year was rather 2006. I was in uh, New York. And the topic of bug finding was in the air. So every uh, job talk that you went to referred to a certain NIST study that how many billions of dollars annually are lost uh, to, to fixing bugs. And if you're familiar with this Gartner hype chart, 2000 must have been close to where the peak of uh, inflated expectations happened. 
yeah, so here, you know, the hype chart is about new technology comes, it raises a lot of hype, and then it goes down, and then it kind of stabilizes. So we were probably at the peak of expectations in, in 2006, and there were lots of uh, companies as well as some academic efforts trying to build innovative um, bug-finding tools, and a lot of this uh, work was extremely interesting. And yet, we did not really see that much adoption of this uh, within the company, and we, left, we were left with asking these questions that what are the inhibitors to adoption? Uh, are there too many false positives? Is it the case that most reports are not actionable? Is it the case that practitioners just don't know which tools to pick and use? Is it the case that it's just too much work installing and maintaining those tools and so on and so forth. So we, we were ex or self-proclaimed experts in bug finding and verification, and we thought, well, uh, let's see, is this an opportunity? Can we do some work and uh, help the internal Java developer community? What if we mitigated all of these issues, right? So we built this uh, bug catching portal uh, in the company. This was essentially bug finding as a service on the cloud. Of course, in 2006, people wouldn't call it cloud, but that was what uh, it really was. And this, this uh, portal would let you e upload code from your code repositories. It would run many tools, so we did all the work of bringing in many, many tools and showing the output of all of those tools in an integrated way, so there were some publicly available tools, as well as some of our own uh, research tools that we have built at IBM. Uh, we worked very hard to filter out uh, false positives using symbolic analysis. We made it easy for people to understand why a bug is being reported. We had all kinds of heuristics uh, to rank bug severity so that people should be needing to only look at the high, most highly ranked bugs and so on. And we had assumed if you build it, they will come. We wrote a paper about this also uh, mentioned, uh, the link to which is, uh, is on this page. It turns out that we, we were way too optimistic. So the adoption of this technology did not really go uh, according to our expectations. So we were left asking the question, was the technology bad? Was our marketing bad? Or was it that the deployment had some problems and so on and so forth? And then now, in retrospect, I believe that it was the same uh, return on investment issue. Uh, as I mentioned before, just because uh, a tool is free, it's coming from research, does not mean that for a developer it is really free. The costs include that the time, there is time to, uh, required to triage the bug reports. And if you spend the time to triage these bug reports and those are not actionable, then you are really increasing the time uh, before which you can release your product. Uh, second thing is that developers are deadline driven. They are not always incentivized on code cleanliness. Now this could vary uh, between companies, but uh, this was kind of, this is a, just a general comment. Uh, and then there are obviously opportunity costs. How much time do we spend in developing the features that are necessary versus just cleaning up code in terms of having the, these bug finding tools uh, shut up. Now, in terms of promised benefit, right, it was uh, that if you look through these bug reports, then you are reducing the likelihood of field defects uh, escaping into your release. But what we failed to do was to present compelling evidence that this was happening. And I feel that the return on investment case was just not made well enough uh, in this particular case. There is a company called Coverity. Uh, they have been investing in uh, bug finding tools for several years, and they wrote a really nice article on this topic as to how developers perceive the value of static analysis and bug finding in the real world. It was in the CACM magazine a few years ago. I have included a link to that. It's a very interesting reading. 
So in a in a little bit more detail, if you if you build a bug finding tool, well, one decision you have to make is that is it a sound tool, meaning that whether it reports everything there is to report or it just picks a subset of reports based on its judgment. So every possible report that could come out of a tool is just way too many. Uh, you would get both true and false positives. Uh, most practical tools will choose to report a small subset of these things, and that small subset I'm showing with this uh, sort of inner, slightly darker circle. It will hopefully report some true positives, and it will necessarily report a bunch of false positives. Now, if you look at the defects that someone cares enough to fix, and that I'm showing by this uh, light colored blob on the top half of this picture, uh, often times we see that the overlap between what is reported by a tool and what someone cares enough to fix is somewhat small. And, and this is kind of uh, a perception problem, it's a cost problem that needs to be uh, considered. In terms of deployment of bug finding tools, we, in retrospect, we have some more observations. One question is that, well, should these tools report findings in the IDE, or should they report find, uh, should they run at build time? We were at build time. Maybe IDE is more effective. We don't know. What's the model? Is it that the management uh, dictates that everyone should obey what the bug finding tool says? or is it kind of a person designated in a team who makes a judgment of which report is actionable, or is it self-service model where developers are uh, left to their choice whether they want to um, uh, deal with bug finding tools, but bug finding tools report at all or not. Also, it matters whether the code under development is enterprise code versus safety critical code, because in safety critical code, the requirements of quality control are often much higher. It also matters whether this, these tools are being run on old code that has been kind of sort of working all along or on new code. People are generally reluctant to do anything with old code. And then finally, some defect categories such as security uh, get a lot more attention than just uh, simple, uh, say, code cleanup kind of uh, defect reports. So I am uh, nearing the end of uh, this presentation. I would like to leave uh, you with uh, a few messages on getting software tools adopted and how to take your research in software tools uh, to business impact within your company. First of all, you have to pick the right problem. There are lots of problems to choose. Uh, you have to see which kinds of tools might have acceptability within your within your company. The second thing is that someone will ask you about return on investment, so you have to have an answer. And just simply saying that, well, uh, this could help, does not, and it is free, does not really cut it. Uh, nothing is free. It's, it, it does cost them in terms of their time, right? Then the third uh, point I'd like to say here is that the that there is not just the last mile, there is really last N minus one mile, and they will test your patience, so be ready for it. And then finally, this is a little bit of a political thing that you have to be mindful of the incentive structures. You have to understand who are the decision makers in your organization and be sure that uh, they uh, are presented with your findings. And that's how you maximize the chances of having an impact. And then finally, uh, if all else fails, here is another kind of traction. So with that, uh, I will uh, now uh, transfer this back to Will and be ready for questions. Thank you very much.
מקבל. היי, סורי, אני חושב שוויל היה על מיוט, אז בואו נגיד להם סקנד להגיד להם. אוקיי. No, I'm not on you. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, I can hear you, Will. You can, okay, I don't know what the problem was. I was off mute. I was saying that there is uh, a lot of interest in your talk, and in particular sharing it with uh, attendees' colleagues at a later time. So I'll point out once again that the uh, slides are, will be available, and the whole presentation, the slides are available for download now, and that the uh, talk will be available in a couple days for sharing. Uh, another comment was that it was great to have those links, and people are looking uh, uh, forward to uh, further exploring the topics that you had. So now with regard to the list of questions that are coming in, I see uh, uh, in an avalanche right now. Uh, first one that came in was getting the sales team on board. Is that your own company's sales team or the customer's sales team? That was my own company's sales team. Okay. Uh, now, has the perception or the inhibitors to adop adoption changed since you initially looked at them based on the evidence of 2006? In other words, have any new issues surfaced uh, or have any inhibitors been mitigated? I think as a community, we have between then and now a much better understanding of how developers perceive the value of static analysis and what are the ways of deployment that work. Um, we were kind of early on in the game, but if we were to do this work again uh, today, we would do many things uh, differently. The understanding of software as a service, things being resident on the cloud, um, and so on and so forth have vastly improved since then, and some of those uh, things would help as well. Also, the process structure, we have a much better understanding of how other companies have been, when they have been successful, what have they done differently. So certainly within the community, there is a lot better understanding of the issues now. Good, good. And now I'm going to combine two questions here, and hopefully you'll, you'll only have to answer one. Uh, was selling to the managers the problem rather than selling to tech leads? And, and then is it creating a pull instead of a push for technology to transition? And, and here's the second part. Is that what you meant by top-down, not bottom-up adoption? Yeah, partly. So, so the tech leads are techies, and they they have technology in, uh, or rather, love for technology in their hearts. And when you talk to tech leads, they are in general quite enthusiastic. However, they are not asked with reliable delivery. So it's the delivery manager um, who has to make the call whether to talk to the client and get a research technology in the pipeline. And uh, so, that, that, so those are different roles. And here I basically um, mentioned issues or costs that come from the perspective of the delivery manager. The top-down versus bottom-up thing was uh, yeah, somewhat similar that in, in some organizations you could imagine use of certain static analysis technology be just mandated by, let's say, the VP of engineering or uh, what have you. And in that case, uh, you know, people uh, 
uh, will have to have to use these tools and then those decision makers are responsible for sort of justifying the value of these tools being used bottom up is more of a sort of a, literally the bottom up uh, effort where uh, people download these tools and they try in their own individual development uh, work and they um, they speak highly of their experiences to their other colleagues and then there is this kind of a, a grounds up uh, effort and momentum built built up so it happens sometimes it happens for certain kinds of technologies and it happens in in certain companies so uh, that that was really the point that, uh, he, that, that th these are two different settings first the first question was about delivery managers versus tech leads and i mentioned the issues there the top down versus bottom up adoption is more of a sort of a company culture uh, issue that i had mentioned in respect of the static analysis deployment okay okay good and now here are two questions and uh, i think they're related but you can answer them separately so the first question is from this experience would you make any observation or recommendations for designing a successful software organization that is could there be a place for teams dedicated to transfer of rich research prototypes into deploy products? Now, that was the first question. The second question was actually had to do uh, with uh, would agile development methods have any impact on technology traction? Okay, let me first talk about the first one. So it's an excellent question and many companies have tried this model where there is an intermediary between the research organization and the practice and it is the job of these intermediaries to kind of take research technology uh, perfect it curate it and then uh, push it into the development organization and certainly that model has a lot of value that model is in play in many companies and it's uh, definitely worth considering now as far as uh, the main topic here of you are a researcher and you want to create business impact now the now the it's just uh, kind of a you have to now deal with another set of decision makers right that, that the presence of that organization now means that they are your catchers. They have to be convinced that they should use or adopt and push your technology. You basically don't have the direct path to developers. So it could cut both ways, uh, but it's a very interesting question, and uh, I think companies have tried both ways. Um, then the second question was about agile development. So I I'm not I'm not sure I have a very good answer there. I just informally associate agile development with also developers having a little bit more freedom and choice uh, in terms of uh, using their own micro process so to uh, speak and using tools on their own rather than adhering to a top-down mandated process so if that interpretation is acceptable then you know then that sort of increases the um, possibility of getting your tool picked up by the developers but in terms of organizational agility as a whole i don't really have a very good answer to the question okay good good and now continuing with the trend of combining questions uh one attendee said uh, one that i have has to do with scripts for test automation you mentioned php java vb are these the main or most used, uh, mostly used for test automation? What about SEDOC? And do these have to do with what you were talking about, or are they up the top? That was actually the first question. The second question said, good briefing, can you provide a short overview of the state of technologies involved? So I guess people wanted to know how you actually did your, uh, uh, created the uh, automated test uh, uh, creation. Uh, yeah system 
So the the techno yeah, so um, will you you your voice broke up in the middle so let me just try to interpret your question i think the question was that what kind of programming languages are used in test automation and what did we use so those details are described in the series of papers that we have written uh, on the topic of test automation and the audience can definitely look up there uh, there are these languages that i mentioned on the slide visual basic and so forth uh, there is java there is there are also sort of proprietary languages uh, in fairly popular products out there they are uh, also very common um, languages such as sed and awk is if that's what i heard you say those are really uh, lot lower pattern matching kind of languages and those are not really relevant to test automation if if i have not answered this uh, properly maybe you should repeat the question because i had difficulty in understanding the full question no i think you have uh, touched on the uh, uh, yeah um exactly what the questioners were looking for and now i have gotten five questions on roi and i'm just trying to succinctly combine them uh, so let's just try how do you deal with roi when your software deals with qualitative rather than quantitative information and then how do you estimate roi and uh, actually could you elaborate on roi and how it explains traction i think you've done a good job on relating that but let, well, let's talk about qualitative versus quantitative information and in roi yes that is a very good question and if you are talking about qualitative uh, your new tool or process making qualitative improvements it's actually very difficult because the benefits are going to be uh, retrospective and they can be only realized much later in time and so there i think uh, you know it is a really the judgment call of the decision makers whether they want to adopt this or not it's uh, i agree that it is extremely hard to document these things but sometimes even having anecdotal evidence and so forth is persuasive my point simply is that saying that my tool is usable and look it can help is just not sufficient you have to have some arguments that say that if you adopt this tool before you had let's say you know just to pick up a term defect term of this a defect rate of this now your defect rate has gone down by this and you can probably estimate these things but i think it helps to even articulate what are the projected costs of using your technology and what are the projected benefits even if you don't have full reliable quantitative data so just having that mindset of roi is perhaps more important than precise numbers in there good good and we have time for one more question here but actually i've got two that once again i'm going to combine so what do you think now about the return on investment of bug finding tools following the early excitement and then disappointment and it, and then i'll combine it with the second question do you see a sweet spot for static analysis for for example security vulnerabilities or concurrency bugs so this is a topic very close to my heart and i would need another 30 minutes to really uh, <laughs> uh go over this uh but yes uh, i think uh, bug finding tools are finding their niche some companies have done a really good job of weaving uh, some amount of bug finding uh, in their tools and processes Uh, if you take a look at the papers presented in the latest uh, ICSE conference that was just held in 2015, I think uh, in early June, you will see papers uh, on this topic of what were the issues and how some companies were very successful in deploying bug finding tools. So certainly, yes, I am optimistic that they do have a place. Uh, they are clearly not a panacea. uh security is a slightly different market uh, security static analysis is 
very specialized and they solve kind of a different kind uh, sort of space of problems so uh, i think you know bug finding and security are sort of different markets and those are two different conversations to have some there is some overlap when you talk about sort of buffer overflow kind of um, uh, uh, problems that you can see both as either a security uh, problem or a static analysis problem but then higher level security problems are really a different class of problems that said the underlying theory of how this all works is uh, all quite related but then these are uh, different markets let me just okay. stop there on the answer because this is a pretty long topic and a lot could, uh, could be said yeah i guess i should have asked the question sooner but with that i'm afraid we've run out of time today and i'd like to thank satish again for his informative presentation and insightful answers to uh, the many questions uh, special thanks to each of you in the audience for taking the time to attend and participate today this webinar, webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org backslash webinar. You can find announcements of upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers which you would like to see on your screen. Uh, this is Will Trace saying goodbye for now. Thanks again for joining us. Hope you will join us again in the future. And that's it for today.